today we have with us uh, Shane Adams. Thank you, Shane, for, for joining us today. Absolutely. And uh, as we will learn, Shane sold a consulting company to Deloitte, correct? Close. Close. The other, their nemesis. Their nemesis. Uh, the larger, the world's largest consulting firm. PwC? Accenture. No. Accenture. Accenture. That's right, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was close. Uh, third's a third's a charm. It's okay. When they were acquiring us, they had to pull me aside at one point and say, "Shane, you're actually pronouncing our name wrong," because I kept saying Accenture. <laughs> they're like, "No, it's like accent." Yeah. Like, oh, okay. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So let's start off with um, how you started the company. What was the idea? What was the nexus of the idea? Yeah. Sure. So I worked for Epic, which is the big elephant in the room when it comes to electronic medical records software. Mm-hmm. So if you think about going to the hospital or doctor office, they no longer write everything down on paper. Mm-hmm. It's all done on computers. And Epic is, you know, they make the software. So think about Microsoft, you have Access, Excel, Word. Epic has the same thing, except they have like 40 different applications. So whether you're a doctor, a nurse, somebody who's just cleaning the beds at the hospital or somebody in the billing office or scheduling appointments, you're going to be logging into Epic to do that. So I worked for Epic. And while I was at Epic, I would travel around to different healthcare systems across the country. And when they purchased the software, not only were they paying Epic licensing fees for using the software, but they would also pay millions and tens of millions of dollars for people like me to come and help mm-hmm. them set it up. Then they would also contract with the Accentures of the world to have these really smart business people come and help them. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of my friends after Epic, they would sometimes get into the consulting industry because as a consultant, you can make a lot more money. Mm-hmm. And so that was my plan is Mm -hmm. to someday work for a company like Accenture, Mm -hmm. if they would have me. I know like growing up and going to school, like working for a company like Accenture, I always thought, oh, I need to go to a better college or get better grades or what have you. Um, And then I was just telling my dad what my plan was. And he's like, Shane, why don't you just start your own? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I had enough like (laughs) confidence, cockiness and arrogance to say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let me do that. Yeah. And so that was how it started. Got it. Okay. Um, I imagine you did some level of competitive analysis thinking, dad, there's other companies that are doing this. How can I compete with them? You know, what was your mindset going into that? Sure. So I had to serve a one year Uh non-compete. And I say serve because it kind of was like a prison sentence, right? I had to wait out one year uh, where I could start my own consulting firm Uh or to even join any consulting firm, Wow. uh, which I don't think is actually legal nowadays, especially if you're in like California. Uh I was in Wisconsin though. Um, But so I had to sit that out. So during that year, I was working for another software company Mm -hmm. and I was starting to do the building blocks for my company, Sagacious. And so a lot of that was kind of the the market research and analysis Mm -hmm. and all right, what was going to be our specialty, our niche? I read a bunch of books um, that had to do with starting a business or just like different industries. And it gave me a a really unique perspective Mm -hmm. of what my company was going to be. Mm -hmm. And how did you know you found something that was sticky, something where you found product market fit, you know, because starting a company and getting it to a point where you can even consider an acquisition is a very hard thing to achieve. Yeah, I would say that, you know, at first it was tough because I thought once my year was up, I was going to open up the doors. And as a consulting company, your product is your people. Your people are your product. Yep. And so I thought, okay, it's really just, I mean, a consulting company is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. You find people who are really good at what they do, Mm -hmm. and then you find clients who need really good people, Mm -hmm. and you play matchmaker. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, um, I'm going to find really good consultants, and I'm going to talk to these hospitals and say, I have better people than Accenture, so pay me money to hire (laughs) these people. And ultimately... uh, that worked, but uh-huh. initially it was very tough because no large healthcare system like MD Anderson or Baylor Scott and White was going to do business with me, a 23 year old at this point yeah. with no name recognition um, and convincing employees to work for me, again, a 23 year old, no yeah. name recognition versus an Accenture with amazing benefits uh, proved to be really difficult. And so I ended up uh, being my own consultant at, f- at first. Mm-hmm. So I was working as a consultant as myself, Shane, but under Sagacious. Mm-hmm. And then I was able to build up a little bit more uh, 
trust within the industry and, and connections and things like that mm-hmm. uh, to eventually start laying the groundwork where I could convince healthcare systems to do business with me and, and people to work for me. Got it. And I also had a secret um, kind of ingredient, hmm. and that was my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. Uh, she, I was able to pressure her <laughs> um, to come work for me instead of an Accenture. Mm. And she had job offers from, from a bunch of other consulting firms. Mm-hmm. And she combined the best of all of them mm. and said, Shane, if you want me to work for you, you have to, to match Ooh, this. That's tough. But it, it was great because it set the stage for what our kind of salary and compensation package was going to be Uh because we really i mean that was part of our market research was taking the best that all these consulting firms were offering Mm -hmm. packaging up to something that you know anybody would take and Mm -hmm. so that was very beneficial and then our first like real client actually came to us because they knew that she was the best at what she did Mm -hmm. and if they had to work with little old shane and sagacious to get her they were going to do it interesting yeah interesting so that how did that work though as you expanded into into additional clients like when they when you were up against the question of you know why shouldn't we just go get, go with deloitte sure so the way i like to put it is i'm a huge backer of elon musk and tesla not just financially by having a, a ton of stock in, mm-hmm. in those companies um, and him but i also drive the car i love teslas and if you think about a tesla it's not a typical car, right? What you think of, it's really a computer on wheels, mm-hmm. right? So if you want to make a Tesla go faster, are you going to take it to the mechanic, you know, down the street who does like hot rods? No, like the person who would be more likely to make a Tesla faster mm-hmm. is some really good, like computer software engineer, nerdy dude who doesn't really know about cars, Mm -hmm. but he knows about software, Mm -hmm. right? And so what our differentiator was, we were hiring people who really knew the software Mm. because now these healthcare systems, when they were purchasing Epic software, it wasn't just kind of an ancillary add-on software that they were going to use. Mm -hmm. It was really transforming their entire business. Mm -hmm. It was transforming the way that they provide care. It was transforming the way that they made money Mm -hmm. and that they made patients healthier. Mm -hmm. And so what I saw was the Accentures and Deloitte's, they were continuing to hire, say, these MBA people, right? Mm -hmm. These very business-minded folks who, frankly, um, they were the ones like trying to slap decals on a Tesla (laughs) right at this point. They they knew how to like make engines bigger and faster. They didn't know the software. Yeah. And so we focus on hiring the software experts. And that was our niche is we were going to hire the technically best people. Uh-huh. And then clients started to see that that actually resulted in, in, in better results for them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So you kind of answered the, the chicken and egg problem uh, by saying that uh, you effectively were your own consultant um, under Sagacious. Um, and so you, you had the, the supply of the, or you, you were the supply and the demand was, was the clients that you kind of already had a network established from your previous job. I'm curious though, when you brought on your employees, you said these are some of the top talent in the industry. How did you pay them as, as a you know, small firm? Why didn't they go to Accenture who could give them a, a much loftier package potentially? Sure. So I believe that the founder or at least the ceo the person kind of running a company Uh has to be a really good salesman right and it's not just selling to clients Mm -hmm. but you have to be able to sell to employees Mm -hmm. and i I don't want to you know just like give myself kudos but it is really it's important for a founder to be able to sell the vision not what a company is Mm -hmm. but where they want to go and what they want to be. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we did at Sagacious really well. And I was able to hire some amazing people that were able to compliment me in that. And I was selling the vision, just like I just said. So that's what we did. And it was tough at first to do that. Uh, Fortunately, uh, for me, I I took a kind of a very easy approach to that and that my first employee was my now wife, right? (laughs) My second employee was my mentee at Epic. Hmm. Third employee was my wife's 
mentee <laughs> at Epic. And so these are all people who yeah. already respected us. Mm -hmm. uh, they liked us. We liked them. Mm -hmm. We considered ourselves friends. Mm -hmm. And so convincing the another the initial core cohort mm -hmm. to like buy into that vision yeah. was maybe a little bit easier because yeah. we didn't necessarily have to start from square one. We yeah. kind of had that built in from prior relationships. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. What would you say to companies who maybe don't have that, who aren't, who aren't led by someone who has good sales expertise in terms of like recruiting talent? Do you think they should outsource or find someone who does? Like, how would you solve that problem if you were consulting a startup? Sure. So. I, I think it's, I mean, that's really tough. I think that's fundamental to the success of the business. Mm -hmm. So you need to bring somebody in as a co-founder mm -hmm. who can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about, you know, I think most of us know the story about Apple mm -hmm. and about Steve Jobs and is it also Steve Wozniak? Mm -hmm. Both Steves, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Jobs was that person who could sell the company. Yep. And I think if you, you know, watch... I don't know. There's probably like three different movies about, <laughs> right? There's an Ashton Kutcher <laughs> version. Least, yeah. And then there's that other dude, who I forget his name version. <laughs> um, but, you know, Steve Wozniak says, hey, Apple wouldn't have existed without me. Yeah. But Steve Jobs could say the same thing because no matter how good Wozniak was at the hardware and the software and the technology, yeah. you need that megaphone. You need that person who could sell it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I think, just paramount to any company. It's like that old adage of um, a startup is really just two people. It's a builder and a seller. You believe that? Yeah, I'd say yeah. so. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, look at, I mean, right now, you know, a, a lot of people are up in arms about Adam Newman, mm -hmm. the WeWork mm -hmm. kind of co-founder and CEO, and he just got a, a uh, like a $1.7 billion pay package to basically leave. Half a million, half a billion of that's actually kind of like a loan. So it's yeah. not actually that, but... Um, at the end of the day, you know, they said if SoftBank didn't just move in with this kind of kind of acquisition or majority control they're about to take over, mm -hmm. if they didn't move in, they said we were could run out of money as early as next Friday. <laughs> wow. And what's ridiculous about that is like how could this company that could be worth forty billion dollars run out of money mm -hmm. like in a week? Yeah. And it's because like whether you hate Adam Newman is he was able to sell the vision. Mm -hmm. And any startup that requires funding, which mine fortunately didn't, mm -hmm. and we could get into that later, but any company that requires funding is really a Ponzi scheme mm -hmm. until they're able to actually make a profit, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's how they all are. Mm -hmm. And so WeWorks the same way. It's just if you're good enough at selling, Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you're good enough at selling to employees who could actually figure out how to make your company mon mm -hmm. money. You were just a Ponzi scheme waiting to get busted. Mm. Interesting. Those are some strong opinions. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I mean, it's, I don't know how you could really argue <laughs> against that. So let's talk about profitability. When did you guys reach profitability? Were you profitable from day one? Yeah. So building a... I don't know. I've, I've invested in a number of product businesses and I always kind of go back to why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Because service businesses are um, a, a lot easier to, to get to profitability because mm -hmm. again, your your product is our people. Right. Um, so for us, we were profitable day one. Uh, the biggest thing for us is, is just working capital, mm -hmm. which really just means having money to pay the bills as you wait to get money in the doors from mm -hmm. your customers. And so, you know, when I first started consulting for myself, you know, we were a team of one, right? And I was working and I would get paid and then I would pay myself through payroll. And so we were profitable from day one, but the tough part, the working capital piece was it might take three, four months to get paid from a mm. client and you need to pay your employees at least monthly. And so, especially if you're a growing company, yeah. you know, we went from like, four to 27 after like our first full year and then 27 to like 80 like when you're growing that much mm. and you have to wait three four months to get paid sometimes mm -hmm. cash flow is a, a huge issue and so my initial way to fund the business because i was kind of in debt from a prior uh business venture was borrowing money from lisa my mm -hmm. wife 
uh, to put into the bank account to then write her a check and pay her mm -hmm. when she came on as an employee. So fortunately, she was a, a good saver and had some money where she could like front me for a month or two until we got paid. But mm -hmm. as we grew, it came in the form of a line of credit. I opened up a checking account like when I was like 16 with my mom and then like my own name when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And it was that same small bank in Missouri, Commerce Bank, that I had a relationship with for like a handful of years. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, can you provide me a line of credit? I'm making all this money, but you know, cash flow is is a serious concern. And so I started off with them, built it up. Mm -hmm. I think initially it was maybe $100,000, and then it grew to millions of dollars with JP Morgan as mm -hmm. we continued to scale. Interesting. And would you say if you didn't have that line of credit with those two banks, how would that have impacted your business? Yeah, without a line of credit, I mean, we would not have been able to grow nearly as fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's because we were putting everything back into the company. Mm -hmm. And even though we had positive like gross margins and operating margins, we needed that additional money to grow the business because, um, yeah, I mean, we just would have grown much more slowly. Got it. And so that was super important. And as going back to the profitability, um, I didn't know, I was completely ignorant to the world of like startup, like investing or mm -hmm. that entire startup world. Mm -hmm. I call it today like the MBA startup mentality. Mm -hmm. was, oh, I could just come up with a great idea, put some slides together and people will give me money for that. Like I didn't know that existed. Yeah. That, that didn't happen that I knew about in my hometown or like my friends weren't doing that. My parents weren't doing that. And so starting a business, it wasn't, that wasn't an option. Mm -hmm. So I thought every business was profitable. Like I, I, I thought when <laughs> businesses weren't profitable, you went out of business <laughs> right. and you filed bankruptcy. <laughs> but you learned, uh, the world doesn't always work that way. Uh, all That's, right. Work. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so year one, 27 employees, year two, 80. That's incredible. Um, yeah, well, so I started the company in 2009 and that when it was just myself and I was consulting myself and then probably like 10 months later, later I hired my wife, Lisa, and then a couple months later, my mentee, a couple months later, her mentee. And so we started off 2011 mm -hmm. with, with four employees. And so I had been going at it for, I mean, the plan, it took you know the year while I was doing my non-compete to kind of materialize, become a company, and then another probably about 15 months where it was very slow going, mm -hmm. but I think that was paramount to me understanding how it was going to actually mm. work, how I needed to sell to clients, how I needed to sell to employees, the mm -hmm. structure of the business. And, but at that point, that's when I hired the first full-time uh, person onto like the internal team, the operations team, mm -hmm. which was my younger brother, Kyle. Nice. And then I transitioned into a part-time consulting role myself mm -hmm. just for a few months. And then I went full-time onto an internal role uh, because at that point I realized, hey, we actually have some traction now. I could, f I don't need to be a consultant myself. I could work on growing the business. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was 2011, start off at four. And I think it was about 27 people by year end. That was just clarification. I'm not sure. I don't think I answered a question. No, no, no. Okay. That's, that's. That's good context. Um, at what point did you consider selling the company? So again, I didn't, I didn't really know that that was an option. Okay. I guess I again, I was completely ignorant. Yeah. I thought businesses like grew and eventually, like maybe you IPO, you become a public company, uh -huh. um, or you went bankrupt. Or you just like stayed some small business. I, d I didn't know that people would just like give you a bunch of money to like, you know, screw off. <laughs> um, so I never really thought about that. But then I think probably in 2013 and, you know, at this point, I don't know, say we were 50 employees, 80 employees. Mm -hmm. That's when an investment bank started like just like kicking the tires around at us, hmm. like randomly calling me or we would go to conferences to, to try to get clients and they would stop by and ask questions. Yeah. And I was always like, why do you, why are you asking these questions? And, you know, and, and then they're like, have you ever considered in this line? I, I hate it. But, um, cause they all would say it, ever consider taking some chips off the table, <laughs> you know, as an analogous to like, uh, uh you know, playing craps or something sure. and like taking chips off the table. No, like I'm just growing this business. 
And so they started asking about selling it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's what made me first start thinking about. It. So that was probably in the 2013s. Got it. And when did you actually yeah. sell the company? What t- what time? So we actually officially sold October 1st, 2015. Okay. Uh, so it, w- it was probably about three years after kind of the initial idea. Okay. Uh, was sparked in my head. So that's a long time. What what happened between then, during that time period that got you to the point where you were ready to sell the company? Sure. So every year we face an existential crisis sure. that was either, well, at this point, I now know either break us or make us, but at that point it was just, hey, it's either going to break us or we're going to figure out how to get through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and each year we ended up figuring out how to get through it and we, we became stronger for that, right? Because that existential crisis, it really uh, shined the light on a fundamental weakness in our business. Mm. And so once we were able to overcome that, that actually made us stronger. Um, so that was, you know, that was kind of scary because it's like, all right, I started off with $100 in the roulette wheel and I won, you know, let's say I said red, it's $200. Next year, you know, 2011, it's on red, I win, that's 400. Next year I win, it's on 800. And that's, and I don't play roulette, I hate roulette because it's just, you know, it's, it's not a smart game to play. And so, you know, that was something going through my head is, you know, we kept facing these existential crises. And at this point, I was making really good money. Mm -hmm. I knew the company was valued at quite a bit, that if we did go broke, that would be much more significant than Mm -hmm. if we went broke, like when we were four people, Mm -hmm. right? So, so the, um, I guess the, the opportunity cost became greater and greater. The cost of continuing to go became greater and greater. Um, in my my wife, girlfriend at the time, you know, she was in the business too. And so both of my brothers were. Mm-hmm. So my older brother came on the business early in, in 2011 as well. Mm-hmm. And I like to say that, you know, if you're at a business for five years, you're working for a company. Now to millennials, that seems like a lifetime, five years at one company. <laughs> um, you know, so you're at five years, but then if your your brothers are involved, you're no longer talking about girls and cars you're talking about work yeah so that feels like double time um and with your wife involved that you know now you're talking about not just like relationship stuff you're talking about work stuff so like just 24 7 yeah so that's like double time and then as running a company you know it's it's like all you do is yeah. a company so it felt to me and instead of like 5 10 20 years so it felt like we were doing it a long time and at some point it's hey we have enough money to, to retire. Like mm-hmm. what's the point of continuing this? Yeah. Uh, so she was pretty, uh, she was on the side of these investment bankers. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then it, it just came to a point where I would say two things. One is, um, Accenture made us a, a great offer mm-hmm. at that time that I thought valued us more than what we were worth. Mm-hmm. Uh, my employees were very, they did not ever want to be acquired Mm. because some of our competitors were being acquired Mm. and we were always like the anti like Mm. Accentures of the world. And so they really didn't want us to be, but I was always pretty upfront saying we would always evaluate every decision Mm -hmm. and weigh the pros and cons. And Mm -hmm. if it was the best path forward, then we would say, yes. So Mm -hmm. I, I would never say we will never be acquired. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought at that point, where the market was at, um, where we were going and what we needed to kind of get that next leg up, mm-hmm. uh, was going to be a very intensive, like reinvestment. Mm-hmm. And I thought it, the, it was pretty risky. Mm-hmm. I thought our employees would be better off, uh, frankly, under the umbrella of something like Accenture. Mm-hmm. It would hopefully be able to take their careers to the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, so ultimately it was, you know, personal decision of, Hey, we're at a point where, you know, we're set. We don't need to keep doing this as a point where I thought our employees at the point would be uh, just as good, if not better off under a large company like Accenture. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it was just like playing that game of roulette. And yeah. at some point, you know, your, your luck's going to run out yeah. or your judgment's going to turn poor. Yeah. Just a matter of time. Yep. So walk me through the process of how Accenture presented you an offer. Did you guys get an offer through um, through them by an investment banker? You know, um, did they just come to you out of the blue and said, "We want to buy your company"? Sure, good question. So, you know, this investment banking company they 
you know, kudos to them for doing business development like very early on, mm -hmm. right? Like, cause that's something we weren't ready, but they stayed with us. They didn't mm -hmm. pressure us too much, even mm -hmm. though, you know, for them, they want to make the sale. Uh, but at, at one point earlier on, we agreed to potentially sell a majority stake in the business. Um, and so we were looking at selling maybe 60% of the business. Mm -hmm. So we succumbed to that stupid phrase of taking chips off the table. We're like, <laughs> all right, we'll take some chips off the table. Yeah. Um, Cause that way we felt more free to make the necessary investment, sure. right? Because, hey, you know, we could go for bust cause bust is, we still got paid out 60% of the value. Mm -hmm. Um, so we went through a process with them where they come up with, you know, your entire kind of, uh, presentation deck and I forget all the fancy names we use, but you know, the entire kind of executive summary and things like that. And they said, all right, these are the companies we think would be interested. And they listed some private equity firms, um, and then also some, uh, strategic acquirers, which are companies that it would make sense to acquire us for us to become part of their company, mm -hmm. right? To fit into their existing business lines or, or grow into new market areas. And I remember specifically, I don't think Accenture was on the list. I, I said, hey, Accenture is one of these companies. They're the Goliath mm -hmm. that we're attempting to slay. It would make sense for them to acquire us. So let's, you know, so you guys push off, push out our information to them. Um, so push it all out and, uh, I think there was some interest, but never really made it to the next step with Accenture. Hmm. Uh, we made it to the next step with a few companies, a large consulting firm, publicly traded firm based overseas. Uh, we made it to the next stage with a private equity firm here in Texas, actually. And we had signed a letter of intent to sell 60% to this private equity firm. We ultimately felt like they were the be better partner. Mm -hmm. um, but then... We were actually driving up to Dallas to finalize this deal. And I think this was 2014. Um, and I remember my older brother, Jesse, what's great is my two brothers and I, we all complimented each other extremely well. Mm -hmm. If anybody has siblings, you know, most of the time you're not always like the same, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm not very artistic. Mm -hmm. Um, Jesse is very artistic. He has a, I'm much more of a rational analytical thinker. Jesse's much more of what you would think of like an artistic person, like more creative things like sure. that. And he was like trying to explain something, how he, he didn't get something with the deal dynamics. And I was just at first thinking like, Jesse, like this is a math thing. Like, <laughs> you know, like I get this, whatever, but he yeah. kept saying it. And finally, like on the drive up, I'm like, wait a second, that does make a lot of sense. And ultimately what it came down to is, and I feel like this is probably true with any private equity deal, mm -hmm. is the deal was good for both parties, but it was really freaking good for the PE firm. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically in this case, they were going to leverage the company, use debt to acquire the stake in us, and that debt would be retained on the books of Sagacious. So paying the interest on that debt would come from Sagacious um, and still we would be paying in essence, we still would own 40% of the company. Mm -hmm. So in essence, we would be paying for the interest on the debt they were using to acquire the company, which that just didn't sound right. It does. It didn't <laughs> sound right. And we realized, that, Hey, that's how these deals work. Um, and so ultimately we drove up there and said, no, we're not doing this. Uh, we learned a lot through this process. Um, with the finance background myself, my younger brother Kyle with an accounting background, we thought we really knew our numbers, uh, but they really like opened our eyes to, hey, you know what, there's a lot more in these numbers that we're not getting. Uh, we're not maximizing the value and the growth potential of the company. Mm -hmm. So we, act, we took a lot from that and very appreciative of those guys. And we really, at that point, did double down on the company hmm. and we accelerated our growth. And then that's when about a year later, out of the blue Accenture called hmm. and later find out that they, they did look at some of our competitors, but ultimately uh, they saw us at this point as like a potential acquisition target. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was out of the blue. And I remember the, the, the lead guy in their M&A just asking, hey, what's your number? Hmm. I'm like, what's my number? Like, I don't have a number. I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I threw out something that I thought valued us well. Yeah. My bit one of my biggest mistakes was giving him a number huh. instead of a multiple. Interesting. Because the process took about seven months 
to go through from that initial call to close. And in those seven months, we continued to grow. And so the number I gave him in February, I, if, if I knew where we were going to be and that it would take the seven, eight months to close, yep. I probably would have given him a large number. Yeah. Now that's one of those, like, we will never know. Yeah. Cause if I said a higher number, uh-huh. they might've said no thanks. Yeah. Right. But so then, so they reached out and then we started having these meetings and that was the genesis and kind of like the start of the acquisition with Accenture. That's really great advice. I love that. I love that. So we're, the first time that you guys, uh, you know, approached Accenture, were you guys just too small, not growing fast enough? What was the reason why they passed? Um, I think it was ignorance on their part. Hmm. No, okay. <laughs> I, I, th- I think um, it was one of the things that we kind of doubled down on is we started doing more strategic consulting. Mm-hmm. So instead of just like staff augmentation, we mm-hmm. really started focusing on this kind of like higher level consulting work, mm-hmm. which carries higher margin, better relationships with the clients. Okay. And I think Accenture started seeing that, wait a second, these guys are actually starting to compete with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that was one of the things. We did grow a lot more in that time frame. I think the the market, they I feel like the Accentures and Deloitte's were kept getting edged out by mm-hmm. companies like ours because we really created this movement of really these technical consulting firms that yeah. did not really exist before us. Yeah. Um, and some of our competitors were venture backed. And so they were able to really shine a spotlight on it. We were trying to grow a little bit under the radar, um, you know, to deceptively acquire their, their customers, venture backed companies. That's not really the way you typically go. You know, you're, you know, I, I see the headlines right now are company updates from companies I'm invested in. And you think they're like, holy, you know, crap, like they're growing like crazy. You know, when you actually come to find out, it's like, oh, no, they're yeah. not. Like these yeah. are kind of shining the best possible light on them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was probably a confluence of factors. And I'm sure there were other things going on within Accenture. But I think we were really starting to take some market share. Yeah. And I think some people within the company uh, start identifying the long tail yeah. that that this transformation to digital record was. And the last thing I just thought about is, I'm not sure at what point, but I know the the like the person within Accenture who led our acquisition, who ended up becoming my boss, hmm. uh, he was somebody that was really pushing for it. And hmm. so I think that might have changed. He came over from McKinsey, and I think he saw that they needed to do an acquisition. They mm-hmm. said they tried to build it themselves, but they realized they couldn't. Mm-hmm. They needed to go acquire, and they saw us as a good fit. You know, one of my last, uh, one of my other guests, uh, Hemi Thacker, who's uh, another entrepreneur here in Austin. Yeah, I know him. Hemi at C10, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he mentioned that companies shouldn't try to uh, focus on, on getting acquired. He said, focus on growing your company, focus on driving you know, sales growth, and acquisition opportunities will present themselves. It sounds very similar to what you just mentioned, which is kind of the first time you were thinking about selling a, a majority stake in your company, um, and then you turned down the deal, and you doubled down on your efforts, and then Accenture came out of the blue and wanted to buy you guys. Yeah, I mean, if you think about if you're growing a company to be sold, like you're just giving that other company leverage, yeah. right? Because if you're you know, because oftentimes the model that you're building for isn't necessarily the most sustainable model. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, look at WeWork. Mm-hmm. You know, they needed a capital infusion to continue to function. But if they were a profitable business, they wouldn't be in that detrimental position. Mm-hmm. Now, there's always a trade off because they never would have grown to mm-hmm. that size. I'm sure if they tried to do it a profitable route, like yeah. it would have probably taken WeWork decades, right, yeah. to do. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that. Like we were focused on growing a good quality business. Some of our competitors who were venture backed and were trying to grow to specific metrics or just grow for growth reasons, mm-hmm. um, never got acquired. And and I think it's partially because of that. Um, and ultimately, um, like Accenture is a company where they pay their employees really well. They have great benefits, great culture. And that's what we focused on too. So we aligned really well. Whereas if you're just like, you got to think about the type of employees you're trying to attract um, because we did not want to compete with companies that were just trying to pay the most mm. to their employees. Because mm. if we were playing that game and competing on price mm-hmm. with our employees, then 
we're just getting like mercenary type of employees and employees that might jump ship when another company comes, especially in a venture backed world where the cost of capital is at least a lot of people think it's, you know, free or cheap. Mm -hmm. I would argue that venture capital is the most expensive Mm -hmm. uh, cost of capital, but it's, you know, you don't want to be competing on that level. We want to compete again on our vision, our ideals, Mm -hmm. our culture and things like that. And, And ultimately that's what, any company that wants to be in business for a long time has to focus on because mm-hmm. they have to focus on profitability at some point. Mm-hmm. Interesting. How was the integration into Accenture for your employees? How was that transition period? Yeah, I think uh, one of the best decisions we made uh, was, so we started conversations with Accenture in February of 2015. Mm-hmm. And the only people who knew about it were my wife, my two brothers, and then we brought on our VP of finance, who was a good friend. And we couldn't have done all the due diligence without him. Mm -hmm. Like it it would have been impossible. So we needed somebody else to help us because we were still trying to grow this business, Mm -hmm. right? In case the acquisition didn't go through. Uh, So the only, the four of us were the only ones who knew within the business Mm -hmm. throughout this, you know, five, six months. And we never announced it to the employees until about two weeks until the acquisition closed. Hmm. And that was because Accenture had to seek approval um, from like the SEC or, or someplace. And when when big companies like that submit approval, there's all these like online yeah. You know, sites that are able to um, aggregate this information and then like write press releases on a story. So they said, hey, we're submitting this tomorrow morning. uh, So we need to do a press release in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so the night before that press release, we called like a special town hall type of virtual call Mm -hmm. to tell all of our employees what was happening. And I think earlier that day, we told our our leadership and management team. Mm -hmm. And then that evening, we had that town hall call with our 275 or so employees. Hmm. And we did it like that because, again, Accenture was the Goliath. They were yeah. the bad guys, right? And so we're like, hey, this is going to be become a big shock. Yeah. Um, and also, an acquisition just is uncertainty. And yep. consultants are supposed to be great with change, but still nobody likes change, especially when it's happening to, to themselves. Right. And so we thought, you know what? If we announce this and we tell these employees, hey, guess what? Your next paycheck, because we actually paid our employees monthly, I think it's crazy if you don't pay your employees monthly. You get bills monthly. You might as well get paid monthly. It's much cheaper. So I encourage all companies to change payroll to monthly. But so we said, hey, your next paycheck is going to be written by Accenture, whether you like it or not, because this deal is closing in less than two weeks. So you don't really have time to freak out. Like you just have time to go back doing your job. And if it turns out to be like a really shitty acquisition, well, then you could quit. Mm-hmm. But so far, you've you've bought into my vision. You've trusted me. Mm-hmm. I haven't stared us wrong. So at least give me the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. that this is a good decision. And if it's not, then quit. No problems. But you know, I, I think making that time in between them knowing and the actual closing mm-hmm. uh, was very key mm-hmm. uh, to having a successful acquisition. Yeah. And and I actually learned that a little bit because. Accenture acquired Chaotic Moon, Mm -hmm. an awesome-based company, actually just a few months before they acquired us in 2015. And I talked to a couple people over there, Mm -hmm. and they had some initial turnover and Mm -hmm. issues, and Chaotic Moon had an amazing culture. And so talking with them, I'm like, okay, this is, you know, I don't want to do that, right? Or I I want to prevent that. How could could we prevent that? And then the actual integration – that that was really interesting because Accenture was a very different company than we were. Mm-hmm. Um, we had great support from, again, the leaders at Accenture who were responsible for the acquisition. Mm-hmm. And my role um, as as the CEO of Sagacious was really to protect as much of our, our culture as possible and to provide our employees with as many opportunities to swim within the bigger sea of Accenture if they wanted to do that, but if they didn't want to do that, Mm -hmm. kind of try to protect the culture within Sagacious and embed as much of our culture into Accenture as possible. Like I believe, you know, I told you I love talking about politics. (laughs) You know, I I believe in the whole idea of a melting pot and the U.S. is a melting pot. And I think just like any great recipe, if you want to spice something up, 
you add some ingredients. You're not trying to change like, you know, some chicken cordon bleu mm-hmm. to like a totally different dish or whatever, right? Yeah. You're just trying to spice something up, give it a little bit of a new flavor. And so I think that was my goal within Accenture. Hey, mm-hmm. Accenture is acquiring us. We're not trying to make Accenture sagacious. That'd be crazy. We can't do that. They're, you know, 270,000 people, mm-hmm. but maybe we could add a little element, take something that's unique about us and spice up Accenture a little bit to make Accenture a little bit better. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I'm curious, you know, you, you, you mentioned kind of looking at chaotic moon, um, and kind of using that as a case study for your eventual um, acquisition by Accenture. Did you bring on any other, or any consultants, advisors, mentors, um, investment bankers, attorneys? Because you mentioned that kind of the first round of potential acquisition that you end up turning down, you're working with a banker. But it, the second time around, did you bring in anybody else? Yeah, so that same investment bank was uh-huh. included in the Accenture acquisition. Okay. Um, I basically directed the person who called me from Accenture yeah. to, hey, go nice. talk to this investment banking firm. Um, now, you know, I could give a ton of advice on working with bankers because, you know, they work similar to real estate agents. Yeah. You know, they work on a percentage commission for the most part. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, you know, could be a tough pill to swallow because yeah. it ends up being a lot of money. Um, we, of course, had to include um an accounting firm. Mm-hmm. We worked with CBiz to do our taxes. Being a consulting company, we were in you know in in the business we were in. We had people. Our employees lived and worked in over like forty two states, mm. and so our taxes were just like ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. Our tax return was just hundreds of pages, and so we had a good relationship with CBiz. Mm-hmm. And during the acquisition, taxes become a big part of that. How you structure the deal, mm-hmm. how you execute, and, and all those things. And so CBiz uh, came on board. And then also we used a law firm called Stinson, who does a number of transactions. Um, Accenture had Kirkland and Ellis, the same. It was a little intimidating because they're the same law firm that represented BP in the Gulf oil spill. Okay. So like, oh man, we're dealing with the, the big guys. Uh-huh. Um, but we had to bring in Stinson to help with that. But when we were first going to sell minority stake uh, to the PE firm, we had him brought on either of those parties because you know growing up without much money and like running the company we were we were very frugal Mm -hmm. and only spent kind of when we needed to and and so forth and so those two the accounting firm and law firm came in you know kind of midway through the deal we had to bring them in at at earlier Mm -hmm. to help structure it and things like that but you know one of the things that i failed to do then and still to this day is just bringing in mentors, mm-hmm. consultants, things like that. Like even when I talk about my relationship like with Chaotic Moon, mm-hmm. like it was like some couple of random people like I just like met out, right? <laughs> it wasn't so much a um, you know, hey, I'm friends with like the founders of Chaotic Moon and we're like having these high level discussions and that's something that I've never been that great at doing and mm. um and so it's it's just been I guess yeah, something that we we leaned on the people that we needed to, but didn't have too much support outside of that. My wife's a great muse, and I get a lot of like great advice from the leadership team we built, and my brothers and my parents. Mm-hmm. Got it, got it. Um, what did the investment banker do for you once you had Accenture kind of there, you know, with with a deal pretty much ready for you? You gave him the number, and you connected them with your your banker. Did he shop you guys around? Um, or were you like, I want it, this is it. Like, this is this is the deal, uh, this is the one I want. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we shopped it around. I think pretty much we said that, you know, hey, this is gonna go through, or we kind of played it like, you know, the hot girl at school where she's just gonna like brush you off, give you the cold sh- shoulder, yeah. right? <laughs> um, where we're like, okay, yeah, if this happens and it happens, if not, we're gonna keep growing this business. Yeah. Cause we, I mean, we were having great success and really growing it. Um, but what the bankers really did was justify our price. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that, again, like feedback or advice when working with the banking firm is rather than just doing a flat percentage, we negotiated a rate where, hey, we told them a number. And if we get that number, then you'll get X amount. Mm. But if you can negotiate us a higher amount, mm-hmm. then that's when you really start to mm-hmm. get a, a good rate of return. Because 
you know, the, the big question is, I think from you is like, why did you use these bankers? What was the value add? And the value add was validating the numbers we wanted mm-hmm. um, and then trying to get us as much as possible on top of that. Mm-hmm. And they also doing these deals, they also could tell us like when we needed to bring in the accounting firm or mm-hmm. the legal team. And because there's a lot more to the deal than just the purchase price. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think about structure, you know, when it comes to like earnout mm-hmm. and retention, um, are they acquiring the stock, the equity of the company mm-hmm. or the assets of the company? Mm-hmm. Um, what's going to happen to all your employees? Um, what's going to happen with non-competes and, and escrow and indemnifications? Mm-hmm. So there's a huge laundry list of things yeah. um, that, that they provided value in. Got it. Got it. Um, who was that investment bank, by the way? Sure. It was called Childs out of Atlanta, Georgia, and they were recently acquired okay. themselves. Um, I want to say the name, but it might be wrong, so I'm not no, going to no, say okay. the name. No, it's okay. But, uh, yeah, they, they were called Childs out of Atlanta, Georgia, and they were just recently acquired and overall had, had a solid relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the deal structure. Was it was it a stock sale? Was it an asset sale? Which one was it? Sure. So... Um, we ended up, man, and this is pretty bad. I think we ended up, like we had to end up creating like a separate company and doing something funky. Okay. It's funny because one of the first due diligence things that Accenture wanted was our articles of incorporation Mm -hmm. and our meeting minutes and like all these things. Mm -hmm. And the only people, we ended up creating a stock appreciation rights plan. Okay. Um, just earlier that year, I think we started it like January, 2015 Mm -hmm. for some members of our leadership team. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as far as actual equity in the company, it was really just the only people who came on with equity or who acquired equity were my two brothers. Mm -hmm. So it's me and my two brothers and, Hmm. um, and we didn't have a board or anything, right? Like we didn't really have like an articles of incorporation Mm -hmm. or like any of that stuff. Yeah. And so when they asked for that, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we have one. And we, you know, we, we kind of just like made it up at that yeah. point. So it looked like we would have one. Um, but, uh, yeah, so so that was one of the things. So some of the things we kind of had to like just figure out because we didn't have. Uh-huh. Um, I, th- I think I'm probably going to answer wrong. I think it was an asset sale. Okay. Um, what they paid us in was, was cash though. Okay. We did not do like, um, we did not get Accenture equity. That was something that frankly, looking at their stock price, I think it was like a hundred at that point. And that's like one ninety. Mm. So it probably would have been a good deal, but, um, no, we wanted to take the money and diversify it. And so I can't remember. Exactly. No, no, that's, it's all good. Were yeah. there any complications or things that like surprised you about the process? Uh, well, I talked about it being a little intimidating working with uh, <laughs> their their law firm, Kirkland and Alice. But yeah. one of the things that was kind of funny is I remember my brother was on a call with them at some point. I can't even remember if I was on the call, frankly, because we had to sometimes divide and conquer because mm-hmm. we couldn't let any of our employees know. And sometimes, yeah. like, I remember one time I was in Florida for a conference with, with some people of our leadership team, and we had, like, a client meeting with, like, a CFO or, or somebody important. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to sell these multi-million dollar deals. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can't make it. They're like, what do you have to do? <laughs> and it was because Accenture was down there and we were having meetings down there. And uh, so we sometimes had to divide and conquer. But I remember on a call, so he might have been by himself, but their lawyer like started yelling and cussing, dropping the F-bomb. Oh, man. And like, my brother's just like, what the like, this isn't professional. Like, why is this guy like crazy? Like, yeah. it's like Jason Bateman or something. I don't know. Psycho, right? He's going crazy. <laughs> and, and our investment bank is like, yeah, no, that's just, you know, that's just a tactic. That's sometimes mm-hmm. like what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was interesting, mm-hmm. uh, to say the least. And then I, I was surprised that like the indemnifications and the mm-hmm. escrow and, you know, say you agree to be acquired for a million dollars, you might, frankly, only get like 60 cents of that up front. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other 40 cents might be held out in earnouts, indemnifications, escrows, and all these things mm-hmm. that you have to, you know, that's why it's so important to structure the deal so that you're going to actually get 
all that money <laughs> that you you thought you were going to mm -hmm. to get in the first place. Got it. Now, if you it's been some time since your since the company was acquired, so you've had some time to reflect. If you were approached by an entrepreneur like yourself, you know, back then, a similar situation, you know, great company, strong business, strong financials, you know, potentially looking to get acquired, what advice would you give them? So at this stage where they're looking to get acquired? Like if you were to consult your younger self. Sure. You know, prior, just prior to the acquisition or maybe like while you're in due diligence, what, I mean, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, let's see. Well, on that particular question, I do feel like we did quite well. Good. Um, That's great. The biggest advice, though, would be on that multiple, on that multiple? number. That's great advice. Right? Don't, don't say a single number. Mm -hmm. Say a multiple. I do always think you have to shoot first, though. Um, I you, learned that. What do you mean by that? Sure. I learned that in, when my wife and I went to Thailand for the first time. I remember going through like the night markets and things, and there's all sorts of trinkets people are selling. And, you know, somebody will be selling just some like little wooden Buddha thing, say, <laughs> for, you know, a thousand baht. Like, let's just say that's $30. And, you know, and you, so you say how much, and they say $30. And you say, oh, hey, I know I'm supposed to negotiate, right? So you say, uh, 20. Um, and they're like, 20? No, 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 no. I can't make a living off 20, mm -hmm. right? And let's just say you agree to 25. Well, what I learned very quickly by going to another night market or like a different part is that same little Buddha thing. If you go up and you say, hey, I'll buy that for $5, they will then mm -hmm. negotiate you to like 10. Mm -hmm. But if they were to say 30 and then you say five, you're starting from their number. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get them to come down to a sixth of the price mm -hmm. they told you. Um, and so oftentimes it's, I think if you say your number first, then the conversation is based off of your number, hmm. right? And so I think that's something that, um, is important. So I'm happy I said a number. I just wish it was a multiple. Yeah. So the negotiation tactic, they call that anchoring. So you want to set a high anchor. See, that's like that fancy stuff I was <laughs> ignorant to. I didn't know the <laughs> no, term no, no, no. That must be from the MBA startup <laughs> school. <laughs> Um, oh yeah. So I wanted to ask this question, which is, uh, if you had given the multiple instead of the, the number, how would that have impacted your operations? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point because at a point after the conversations with Accenture, we did start looking at our metrics a bit, yeah. uh, before, I mean, uh, if we made an extra dollar of profit, it was an extra dollar of profit. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were concerned about margins because we didn't want, you know, if we offered one customer less, we didn't want to make that a habit. We didn't want to enable our sales team to see that as a, a potential option, right, to lower our price. And that would start a downward trend. But for the most part, we were optimizing for growing profit, the actual profit dollar amount. Mm -hmm. um, and with Accenture, a publicly traded company like them, if they grow their revenue by 10%, but their margin drops by 1%, uh, there's a good chance their stock will drop the next day hmm. because erosion of margin is so important. Um, it's a leading indicator, and that's what worries a, a lot of kind of investors. And so for us, we, we knew that, and you know sometimes we looked at some of those metrics, and even though we were pegged to a number, we still knew that our performance was going to indicate whether they were going to like, because we always thought, hey, you know, that number wasn't like written down, right? Like they could have came back and give us, said, no, actually, after doing all this due diligence, spending six months of your time, we actually think you're worth, you know, 10% less. Hmm. Um, and so we were still kind of working to make sure we, we showed the performance we wanted and the performance we thought they wanted. And so some of the things I know we were doing um, were being impacted by what we perceived as Accenture's like ideal kind of metrics. Got it. Yeah, that's great. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would I would think if it's like a multiple driven, you try to accelerate growth as fast as you possibly can. Um, you know, because the due diligence process typically takes six to nine months, and you can do a lot 
a lot in that time. Um, great advice about taking the multiple over over a flat number. Yeah, and I, I guess it depends on if your business is flatlining, right? <laughs> too, or like trending down, then, yeah. then a multiple is probably yeah. not a good idea. It's yeah. just the way it happened for us was we were trending up, so That's great. multiple would have worked out better in that situation. It's a great outcome regardless. Yep, absolutely. Well, Shane, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. And Mark, I can't leave without plugging Slay Foundation. Okay. That's slafoundation.com. And that's a foundation Lisa and I started uh, where we are working with middle school and high school students mm -hmm. um, to bring in young professionals into the classroom to really accomplish three things. One, educate students on career opportunities that are out there. So growing up in a blue collar family like I did, I didn't know like what anybody in these downtown office buildings did, um, let alone what their titles meant. And a lot of the kids growing up nowadays, they don't know what these people do. So I think it's kind of crazy. We expect kids to like go to school, do their homework, get good grades um, when they don't know what for, mm -hmm. right? They see somebody like LeBron James or Steph Curry, mm -hmm. they're going to practice basketball every day after school because they know what could become, even though the odds are extremely unlikely that they'll become you know, an NBA player. And so we bring in speakers to the classrooms to educate them on career opportunities, inspire them through their own stories. So sharing stories like this, success stories, and a success story isn't, you know, as like financially successful as mine. It could be just somebody who has an entry level job at a you know the bank or you know a financial analyst, just somebody who could share their story authentically, the hardships, the ups and downs that they've experienced, so that a kid in that classroom could maybe see themselves staying in the front of the classroom, you know, 10 years from then. And then number three, it's providing a professional network. So be willing to connect with these individuals on LinkedIn because mm -hmm. it's not just what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. So right now we're growing this. It's a nonprofit. So, you know, there's no financial interest. It's really just trying to do good mm -hmm. um, and selfishly because every, everybody does something selfishly. You know, that's why people do things. It's so that, you know, maybe one day a kid that we inspire could be the one who cures cancer, right? Or does something great because that will make my life better because I'm probably going to get cancer or Alzheimer's or something. <laughs> like we all probably will. Um, but, yeah, so we're scaling that. So if you are a young professional who would like to go into a classroom or come on to my podcast, The Power of Storytelling, and share your story, we'd love to have you. If you're a corporation who wants to offer your employees this benefit to go into the classroom, we'd love to sign your company up and your employees up to be part of this. I love it. Where can people go to learn more? Slayfoundation.com. Awesome. And we'll include a link in the show notes. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Mark. Cool.